Eurocom is a name that you will see that is highly involved with the James Bond franchise. They were responsible with making the N64 version of The World Is Not Enough. The audience had high expectations from the studio since they were making a sequel to the beloved GoldenEye. While not a groundbreaking title like GoldenEye, The World Is Not Enough is a solid and underrated shooter that represents some of the best FPS action found on the N64. But with this entry, the developers were just getting their feet wet with the franchise, as their next game was going to easily be one of the best Bond games of the entire franchise. With their second game, they were going to have the opportunity to create an original Bond adventure and take many elements from Bond's rich movie history. Now just like with The World Is Not Enough, two completely different versions were going to be made for this game. Eurocom was in charge of the console version, where Gearbox was handling the PC version. Join me as we take a look back at Nightfire. With EA seeing success with the original story featured in Agent Under Fire, they wanted to make another Bond title that was inspired by the films but not tied down to a specific movie. The next Bond movie that was set to come out was Die Another Day, and EA was not interested in making a movie tie-in game, but rather an original Bond experience that could be available to players around when Die Another Day was released. With Redwood Shores working on Agent Under Fire along with other projects, including different entries within the Bond franchise, another developer was brought on to develop this new Bond game. Eurocom was responsible for the N64 version for The World Is Not Enough and was brought on to make James Bond Phoenix Rising. This was later changed to Nightfire. Like Agent Under Fire, this new game was going to be a first-person shooter with vehicle-based sequences. Eurocom was excited at the prospect of making a Bond game not based on a film. The developers found that creating an original piece of fiction allowed them to create incredible moments designed for the best possible gameplay experiences right from the beginning. And second, Secondly, this allows the developers to pull from any Bond films that they wanted to reference within their game, including car sequences from Die Another Day, or even having an underwater sequence like The Spy Who Loved Me. So this was going to be the first time where a Bond game featured an original song to go with an intro for the game. Since the team was aiming to make something original, they felt this was a great opportunity to really make this game feel like a completely new Bond experience, and that was an important element to the films. In addition, while Pierce Brosnan did not lend his voice to the game, the developers were able to scan and use his likeness within their adventure. Eurocom had the background from the world is not enough to expand on what they accomplished for this new game. The team wanted to feature gunfights while also providing opportunities for stealth and gadgets. Some gadgets were going to be used for combat along with others helping Bond find different ways to navigate the levels. The grapple was going to make a return, the laser watch was going to be used to disrupt electronics, along with a useful sleep dart along with a stunner for non-lethal options. In many cases there was going to be a nice mix of levels with more linear type action along with options to explore. This would provide some exploration to the player along with replay value. Eurocom planned on including a multiplayer mode that include a large amount of options, unlocks, and even fun mini vehicles to use. The same Need for Speed team responsible for the driving levels within Agent Under Fire were brought back for the driving levels for Nightfire. Inspired by Die Another Day's car sequences, the same car was used within these levels. The driving levels would feature high-octane action along with some innovative sequences that had Bond's car act as a sub for some underwater sequences. Now just like with The World Is Not Enough, Nightfire was going to have different versions being made at the same time. Eurocom was developing the version for consoles, and Gearbox was handling the PC version. The main difference between the versions was how the PC was not going to feature the same vehicle-based levels. The PC was aiming to have more expansive single-player levels along with a more robust multiplayer. Eurocom had experience with making a Bond game, along with it being a solid entry within the series. Nightfire allowed them to build off of what they had made and make an even better entry. In November 2002, Nightfire was released to the world.
Nightfire's gameplay is a combination of first-person shooting with more linear and open levels along with rail shooting sequences and using Bond's car. The first-person action holds up well with improved aiming from Agent Under Fire along with more levels where you can really take in the environments and in some cases actually explore and find alternative paths. The rail shooting is mostly good with some issues with it towards the end and the car sequences are great but just a bit too short. Nightfire provides an original story with improved presentation from Agent Under Fire along along with quality gameplay that is both enjoyable and full of variety. Before we discuss the gameplay mechanics, I want to discuss the first two levels of Nightfire. The combination between the first and second levels delivers an effective intro that completely absorbs the player into the world of Bond. The first level is a very on-rails experience with minimal gameplay. There are several action moments within the mission, but most of them pretty much act like quick time events as the game is trying to teach you how the game is played. From the presentation standpoint, this is pretty good from the cutscenes to the different events going on. Things get more interesting once you can start driving the car. During this sequence you are in full control and actually get some nice real gameplay. This is rather short but just used to bookend the first level with a fun bit of spectacle like in a Bond film. What was a nice surprise was how after this level the game has a title sequence similar to one that you would find in the films. The second level is just the exact opposite to the first level. Where the first was an exciting opening with very restrictive gameplay, the second level allows you to soak in the environment and presents you with a lot of options and some appreciated exploration. When you start this level, there are a few ways to complete it. You can go the standard route and follow the car tracks. Then there's a fun side route that dodges most of the enemies and lets you use your grapple to get up to where you need to be. You can also drop down into a wine truck and avoid everything altogether. Also within this level, you can climb up a middle tower and find some useful body armor. The second level has some nice options while providing avenues for different playstyles. If you want to go guns blazing, you can do that, or you can take a sneakier approach, or you can take a side route that minimizes how many people you will encounter as well. It is a relatively small space, but big enough and smartly done to provide you with some nice options. To further this quality level design is depending on which avenue you choose to go into the next area, this will change the different location of the starting area for the next section. If you choose to hide in the wine truck, then you will end up near the wine cellar. If you decide to go straight through the door, then you will be in the center of the stage. If you choose to take the left route from the gate, you will end up on the wall. The game does not tell you all of these things are options to the player. All of this is presented and provided through player discovery. The player is rewarded for experimentation within the second level, and it's very satisfying to do. Along with this, it provides a lot of replay value to the game. The icing on the cake is that this section is reasonably open as well, and provides a nice space to explore and find your objectives along with providing different playstyles. The first level is very restrictive with its gameplay, but the presentation more than makes up for it, as it does a great job of providing a quality presentation from a Bond intro along with giving us a taste of using the car. The second level lets the game breathe more and treats the player like an adult, and allowing them to complete parts of this level in many different ways. The first two levels create a compelling intro to the game and effectively hooks the player through its presentation and its gameplay. The final part of the second second level is all centered on action and it's great as well. The first person shooting sections takes up the bulk of the game. Just like Agent Under Fire, Nightfire operates with an auto aim system. The auto aim feels more refined and overall better than the auto aim in the prior entry. I had less trouble hitting enemies that I wanted to, and you can also fine tune your aim with a manual aim button. There is a good variety of different weapons to use. You have different pistols, SMGs, snipers, rifles, and even some unique weapons like a beam rifle and a crossbow. The arsenal is pretty good and provides you with some nice options along with certain levels with 
within the campaign where a new weapon is the star of the show, like the crossbow for stealth. Overall, the weapons sound pretty good. The impact is where the weapons could use just a bit extra punch to them. I just want the shots from the guns to land with a bit more punch and impact. The death animations are decent as well. Another nice option is how most of the weapons have an alternative fire by either changing the rate of fire, providing a scope, or optional silencers. Overall, the shooting is enjoyable and in some areas has aged even better than Agent Under Fire. One area that I value a lot for Bond games are the variety that they can provide you, either through different forms of gameplay or the different shooting situations that the game can put you in. Bond is a character with a broad skill set and this should be available to the player through the gameplay. Nightfire does a really good job with variety even with the first person shooting levels that you will experience. Where Agent Under Fire provided a roller coaster and awesome experience, Nightfire goes for more peaks and valleys and overall improves on providing different situations. Nightfire does have its fair share of linear high action levels where there aren't many options on how to tackle a level other than choosing which weapons you want to use. But there's also a handful of levels where the levels are more open, allowing for different play styles to accomplish your objectives. The second level is a great example of this with multiple approaches and those approaches affect the starting location of the next section. The Japanese estate mission is more of a direct action level, but the way it is designed it has more open areas and in some cases secret paths that allow for alternate play styles. You can tackle parts of this with optional stealth or go into full action mode. And lastly, near the end of the game you get to sneak into a hidden base with a crossbow for stealth kills and there's plenty of optional vents to go through for different paths. The sense of choice, exploration, and player discovery never really reaches the high quality of the second level, but after that point many of those levels definitely strive to achieve what the second level was going for. Even some of the more action focused levels have at least some of that open feeling to them with an enjoyable sniper section that is great to play. You need to use your camera to identify targets and then work your way through it without being hit. And this level is a nice mix of sniping and regular gunfights. This type of stuff provides a decent amount of exploration and provides replay value in finding alternative approaches. Between the action, stealth, and options for both, there's a good amount of variety to experience within the campaign. I love most of the levels within this game and the replay value is very high. Along with this, you will earn unlocks for single player and multiplayer as you are evaluated at the end of each level. In many of the first person levels, you have access to different gadgets to use. You can use a taser for non-lethal takedowns, a grappling hook for getting up to higher locations, a laser watch for disrupting electronics and cutting off bars, the camera is useful for highlighting enemy locations, and many others. Then there are rail shooting and vehicle levels. The first rail shooting stage is pretty good, lots of explosions and good shooting. There are two rail shooting stages towards the end of the game that go on for far too long and they're not as enjoyable as the first section. Part of this is because the level is just a bit too long. The first part of this level is an enjoyable driving section which transitions into a rail shooting stage while flying but you don't get any refills for your health. After that section there is a final turret section and you do receive some armor but there's a good chance that you won't have enough health to make it through it. This would be fine if this level was shorter. The vehicle sections fare much better. There are three driving levels and these are really great to play. The cars handle well and the action is direct and exhilarating. The cars can use machine guns, missiles, and some gadgets. My only issue with the car sections is that they are way too short. I just wish that there were a bit more of them or that the levels were longer. I had the same comment about Agent Under Fire's vehicle sections as they are great parts within these games. There is a vehicle section in the game where you can control a subversion of the car. The first part of the section is annoying since it's an instant fail section. After this the mission gets a lot better, but controlling the vehicle is not as enjoyable as it could be because it's locked into being inverted and there doesn't seem to be a way to change this. The mission is sort of a mixed bag and sticks out with all the other high quality vehicle levels. I appreciated the effort for variety, but the execution was a bit mixed here. A nice surprise was how the final level acts as a fun boss fight to bookend the game. It takes place in space and you have a laser rifle and you need to contend with other enemies along with stopping missiles from launching. The zero gravity combat is enjoyable and all of this factors into a nice spectacle for the ending. The story is enjoyable with improved presentation from the prior game. The mission briefings are higher quality than the still images from Agent Under Fire. Each of the different 
different briefings are all short and sweet cutscenes. All the cutscenes hold up pretty well, with some great presentation for the entire campaign. The only thing that sticks out are the stiff arm movements for the characters. The story is predictable and lacks depth, but it is very enjoyable and a solid original story for a Bond video game. Essentially, Bond needs to stop a bad guy from doing a large, world-ending threat, and the quality story parts come from the suave and fun portrayal of Bond, along with the different locations and situations you will be in. The tone of the story is more like a Connery or Brosnan film with some nice humor. Sorry to drop in like this, but would you ladies mind giving me a ride? <laughs> nice landing, James. Why do you always seem to end up on top? Uh, the lower center of gravity? Essentially, the plot is a standard Bond plot and takes inspirations from other Bond films. It hits all the right beats and works for the game. The weakest element of the game is the villain. He is not that compelling nor intimidating at all. He is just a villain that Bond needs to stop and nothing more than that. There are some flaws within the story, but they never got in the way of the enjoyment presented in Nightfire. When it comes to other flaws that I haven't brought up yet, there are some bullet spongy enemies for some of the villains. More so, these fights with the main villains outside of the final encounter are lackluster and I wish they were were a bit better. And lastly, I wish that there was just one more regular first-person shooting stage before the finale in space. Nightfire could use some more refinement in some of its areas, but for about 90% of the campaign, it is thoroughly excellent with great gameplay variety and a solid presentation. Another great part of the game is the multiplayer section. There's a large variety of different modes from Deathmatch, King of the Hill, Capture and Defend, and other modes. You can change which set of weapons that you feature within each of the matches. I wish you could customize which specific weapons will spawn in the levels, but you can only customize what set of weapons you will see. There's plenty of options, maps, modes, and bots to play around with. One very awesome inclusion are the mini vehicles that you will find in the levels. You will find either a mini tank or a helicopter, and both are great to get some quick kills and are fun to use. One area that I wish was a bit better was the use of the grappling hook. In Agent Under Fire, you could attach to anything within the map, but in Nightfire, you can only attach to specific points. Even with these things, Nightfire has a multiplayer that is very enjoyable and worth returning back to for bots or with friends. I love the console version of Nightfire, now let's discuss the PC version. The PC port of Nightfire was not made by Eurocom, but rather Gearbox. Usually the PC ports of games are generally better with more options, mouse and keyboard movement, and other features. But the PC port of Nightfire feels like an abridged version of the console game that removes full levels and sequences, creating this feel like a rushed and messy game. The PC version does not include any vehicle sequences or rail shooting stages from the console game. These sequences were short within the console versions, but they were generally exciting levels, and their absence here doesn't make any sense. Now I would be fine with the levels being removed as long as the core shooting was good. The movement does feel smoother since you can play on a mouse and keyboard, but the shooting is worse than the console versions. The sounds of the guns are decent, but the impact and shots feel weightless. There's a lack of any gray puffs or smoke when you're hitting your enemies that are at least present on the consoles. The weightless feeling takes a lot of the fun out of the shooting. The shooting here really needs more impact to your hits. Along with this, the game does a horrible job of conveying to the player that they are taking damage along with where that damage is coming from. In the console version, the screen will highlight red areas of the screen, giving you some indication where the enemy is shooting you from, and the screen will go very red if you take a big hit. On the PC, the screen shakes a bit to indicate that you are taking some shots, but not any indication where you are being shot from. The first level in the PC version is similar to the second level on the consoles, but it feels a lot smaller. You have some different options, but everything feels more smushed together. Then there are parts of the escape sequence that were found in the console version 
and that are removed altogether. There are still some gadgets, but nothing you haven't seen before and better used in the console version. The AI is pretty bad as well, in some cases outright ignoring you shooting a light right in front of them or shooting one of their allies. The multiplayer is pretty good for some dumb fun, especially with the inclusion of bots. Another example of a bad choice is how the PC version takes out the on-rail section from the winner section and, in its place, provides you with another first-person level. But this is full of instant fail stealth and it's not that fun to do. It has a lot of trial and error, but when the base gameplay is just average at best, you lose motivation to continue. Considering Gearbox has some good talent through the use of their Borderlands series and Brothers in Arms games, but sadly none of that talent is presented here. It is extremely disappointing what this game ended up being. When it comes to the PC version, it's really not worth checking out unless you are really curious about the different version of Nightfire. Now before we move to the conclusion, I want to praise the soundtrack within this game. Like Agent Under Fire, the soundtrack is of high quality with lots of different versions of the 007 theme. And then there are quality tracks found within the single player and the multiplayer levels. Here are a few tracks from the game. Nightfire for the consoles is easily one of the best Bond games. It provides many quality first-person shooting stages, along with a lot of variety. The second level provides excellent level design with its exploration and how you can tackle the first two sections. This type of level design is provided in other levels and helps to provide more replay value allowing for different playstyles. The more linear-focused levels may lack some of the exploration, but the action still holds up very well. The vehicle levels and rail shooting stages allow for some nice short and sweet set pieces to help bookend certain certain areas. The multiplayer holds up very well with lots of options and bots. While the console version has received praise, this is still a game that I consider a bit underrated as it's one of the finest Bond games and deserves even more attention. Sadly, the PC port is easily one of the worst Bond games that I have played. It feels like a lazy version of the console version. If you are a fan of Bond or just first-person shooters, you owe it to yourself to play the console version of Nightfire. Thank you very much for watching.